Hi there, this is Michelle Mack. Thank you for joining me. I'm recording this in my cabin near Fairbanks, Alaska. My cabin sits on thawing permafrost soils and it is nestled in the mosquito rich and fire prone black spruce forests that I'm gonna talk about today. My talk's titled Impacts of Increasing Wildfire Severity on the Long-Term Carbon Dynamics of Alaskan Boreal Forests. And it's going to focus on research related to three key LTER network themes, disturbance, ecological legacies, and the resilience of the carbon cycle to changing disturbance. So in the boreal forest and Arctic tundra where I work, wildfires have the largest footprint of any disturbance on the landscape. They're ignited by lightning and they lar burn largely in wildlands. Climate warming is driving an increase in the footprint of fire on the landscape and we're seeing increases in fire intensity, fire severity, and in the annual area burned. Moreover, we're seeing that fires are surprising us by turning up in new places. And here's a picture of a fire in the cold, wet, permafrosted tundra of Alaska's North Slope, and it's the first fire in this area in 3,000 years. So in the case of a warming triggered disturbance like wildfire, the potential arises for feedbacks to emerge between the biosphere and the atmosphere. We see increased air temperature, warming, drying, increased turbulent mixing that can trigger more lightning emissions, more rapid fire spread, and more fire on the landscape. Now fires instantaneously transfer carbon from the ecosystem to the atmosphere, and this creates an immediate positive feedback to warming through the carbon cycle. But fires also alter long-term controls over carbon cycling internal controls in ecosystems. Fire can alter carbon inputs by altering plant productivity and also alter carbon outputs by altering decomposition. So the question is thus, can the ecosystem recover the carbon lost in fire prior to the next fire? Is the carbon cycle resilient to changing fire characteristics or is it vulnerable to change? And it's this that ultimately determines whether this feedback arrow is negative, stabilizing, and slowing the feedback to climate warming, or positive, accelerating climate warming. So the general question that I'm interested in is understanding what ecological factors confer resilience or drive change in carbon balance as disturbance changes. Okay, so let's start here with a simplified cartoon of carbon balance, um, showing you first accumulation during primary succession, and then the catastrophic punctuation of fire, which reduces pool sizes, and the slow recovery over secondary succession. Here I've depicted simple neutrality and carbon cycle resilience. The carbon lost in fire is replaced prior to the next fire. This panel then shows more severe burning, and this, in this case, I'm defining severity as the proportion of the ecosystem carbon pool that's combusted by fire. But the recovery over the longer time scale is business as usual. And as a result, the ecosystem becomes a carbon source over the fire cycle. So this is then a positive or accelerating feedback to climate warming. Now we know that when carbon is combusted, other elements are also lost. And in Northern ecosystems, nitrogen is the element most likely to limit plant productivity. So as nitrogen is combusted and lost during fire, well, this could actually limit plant productivity over the cycle of recovery, making the ecosystem a bigger source of carbon than it would be from fire losses alone. And there are more factors afoot. Organisms are killed and damaged by fire, opening up space for the recruitment of new individuals, new genotypes, and even new species. It's an opportunity for reorganization of the ecological community and for the initiation of alternative successional trajectories of recovery. In some systems, this has resulted in increases in productivity that could lead ecosystems to become a net sink over the inter-fire interval. And in other cases, 
Well, it's led to losses, which could lead to a net source. Okay, so let's focus on the landscape of the Bonanza Creek LTER, which is the landscape that is out my window right here. Black spruce has dominated the forests of interior Alaska for the past 5,000 years. It's highly flammable and fire has been on the landscape as long as this charismatic, quite beautiful species has been present. In these historic stands, most of the ecosystem carbon is stored in the thick accumulation of forest floor and organic soil. And these organic soils, they emerge from time lags in the interactions between plants, soils, and microbes. The production of carbon outstrips decomposition and carbon stacks up over post-fire succession. Organic soil also provides the surface fuels that carry fire and accounts for the majority of carbon emissions during combustion. Now there's evidence that more intense fires are burning more deeply into this thick organic soil layer and releasing more carbon and more nutrients during fire. The fire return interval for this forest type is about 100 years and fires tend to be stand replacing. Now black spruce has semi serotonous cones, so seeds are released following fire and they're relatively large and they fall close to the parent tree. They germinate on just about any seed bed and these seedlings grow slowly. Even liverworts we have seen grow faster than black spruce seedlings. So you can think of this as a self-replacement trajectory of secondary succession, where the soil and the seed legacies of past ecosystems are carried forward and confer resilience to long-term carbon reaccumulation. Okay, so that is the context. Here then is the research. In 2004, we had a great opportunity for our LTER group in the form of a regional extreme fire year. 27,000 square kilometers of forest burned in interior Alaska. This was seven times greater than the long-term average area burned. And so we went out and we set up 100 sites in newly burned black spruce forests that span the regional gradient of moisture. In this context, this is soil drainage and severity. So in this case, the proportion of the soil organic layer that was combusted. And we estimated combustion and we monitored tree seedling regeneration. And we also assembled a series of what we call chrono sequence sites so we could understand that longer time scale, 100 years of post fire recovery. This is a, a new network of sites that we call the regional site network. Here's a picture of Jill Johnston, who is the leader of this project. And in here she is in 2005, looking quite happy as she surveys tree seedling recruitment. And we've remeasured recruitment multiple times, most recently in 2017, to determine where and why black spruce stands return to black spruce after fire, and where and why they may shift to alternative successional trajectories. We combine these decadal scale observations of tree regeneration to measurements of carbon combusted during fire. So on the x-axis is pre-fire soil carbon and on the y-axis is post-fire or residual soil carbon. The one-to-one -one line is in the middle and each point is a site average. How far a point is off the line shows how severely it burned in that 2004 fire. So, Low severity burns that are close to the one-to-one -one line, you can see that they're largely blue with some green. They remained spruce dominated. While high severity burn stands, so the, the points that are off the one-to-one -one line, transition to deciduous dominance, dominance by tree species such as aspen and birch. So severely burned stands lost the legacy of that pre-fire soil organic matter. And deciduous trees such as aspen and birch preferentially recruited on the mineral soil that was exposed in the sites. And then they grew fast and they dominated recovery. So what we think this shows is that increasing disturbance severity alters the fit between the characteristics of burning and the plant life history. And it also then raises the hypothesis of an alternative successional trajectory where severe burning has erased 
the soil and even the seed legacies of the historic black spruce forest and has opened up space for recruitment of these really fine, small seeded deciduous species. So our next question comes then to the longer time scale of post fire recovery. Can these severely burned stands recover fire driven carbon losses over secondary succession? Okay, here's the chrono sequence data. I have time after fire on the X axis and ecosystem carbon pool on the Y axis. And you can see that the stands that transition to deciduous trajectories as shown by the yellow lines and yellow dots, these sites stored five times more carbon at 100 years than did stands that remain spruce. And what we think is going on here is that these stands on deciduous trajectories store substantially more carbon because of higher ecosystem nitrogen use efficiency. You can see that at the initiation of succession, those deciduous stands have substantially less nitrogen than spruce stands, but they reaccumulate it more rapidly so that by 100 years, there's no difference in ecosystem nitrogen pools. And what we think is going on here is that there's relatively rapid transfer of nitrogen from deep soils in these deciduous stands, a transfer that we don't see in the spruce stands. Also, we see that the deciduous stands have a carbon to nitrogen ratio in the ecosystem that's two times higher than in spruce, and there's substantially higher allocation to above ground biomass than below ground biomass in deciduous stands than in spruce. So our hypothesis for what's going on here is that what we're seeing are plant soil microbial feedbacks that catalyze the transfer of nitrogen from low C to N soil organic matter to high C to N trees. And this stabilizes or it reinforces carbon cycling trajectories over the long time scale of post fire recovery. In closing, I'd like to return to my focal question. The factors that confer resilience, so the return to the historic carbon dynamics of that black spruce forest are primarily the fit between the historic disturbance characteristics and plant life history traits. Over the longer time scales of post-fire succession, we hypothesize that plant soil microbial feedbacks emerge that reinforce that trajectory slow decomposition, slow nutrient regeneration, and the reaccumulation of the soil organic layer. But high intensity disturbance is driving change, and that is through the exposure of novel seed beds. This opens up a window for the establishment of new species, fine seeded, wind dispersed species. Over the longer time scale of secondary succession, feedbacks emerge that reinforce the characteristics of these tree species, high growth rates, fast decomposition, rapid nutrient regeneration, and high productivity that ultimately leads to an increase in carbon storage. So to return to this idea of ecosystem atmosphere feedbacks, we see that increasing fire on the landscape is burning more deeply into the soil organic layer. It's reducing ecosystem carbon and nitrogen stocks, and it's promoting the reorganization of the plant community and the initiation of an alternative state that functions differently and stores more carbon. So taken together, rapid fire-driven carbon loss and decadal scale recovery shows a negative or a stabilizing carbon cycling feedback to climate over the interfire interval. We also know that deciduous trees are less flammable than black spruce and they can reduce fire spread. They usually have lower fire severity and thus can create a negative feedback via the fire regime. We also know that deciduous trees increase albedo, especially in springtime, leading to regional atmospheric cooling. So it's likely that the net feedback of increasing fire severity, at least at the ecosystem scale, is stabilizing 
or slowing. It's a negative feedback to climate warming. And we're working on expanding this ecosystem scale understanding to the landscape and to the region. Thank you very much for listening to my talk. And many thanks to all of the members of my lab, the LTER group, and the above fire team. <laughs>